Thank you for those of you who are tuning in today to the Career and Professional Development at HBS webinar. My name is Liz and I manage college recruitment here at Harvard Business School. And I am accompanied by Kristen Fitzpatrick, who is the Managing Director of Career and Professional Development. So today's agenda, we're gonna go through a couple of slides with Kristen and she's going to go through some of the most commonly asked questions and sort of information and factoids that people are looking for. And then at the very end, we're going to start with a list of those questions that you submitted to us when you registered for this webinar. And then we will have some live questions as well at the end. So if you have any questions throughout this time, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. That is for questions and answers for that live section at the very end of this presentation. So take it away. All right, minute. let's get started. So career is something that's on most people's minds after the MBA, so I'm going to talk through how we approach it here at HBS. So the very first thing to understand is our mission. We enable MBA students and alumni in the lifelong realization of their unique career vision. So a couple of things to highlight there. Enable, so we, we don't have a magic bag of jobs, but we help you figure out what the right path forward is. And in terms of the unique part, you can see how many students we have in each class. We treat each student and each search individually. So while you're here as a student and then after you graduate as an alum, you maintain access to our services until the day you no longer want to be gainfully employed. So for life, you have support from our team. And students can choose to use our coaches, they can choose to use our, our programs, they can use our job posting. So there's a lot of different things you can use while you're here. In terms of where the class of 2019 landed, one thing we're seeing more and more is that students are waiting to do that full-time job search. There's less anxiety about having something figured out nine months before graduation. Now our students are confident waiting until graduation sometimes to even start that job search. So this is another year where, where students did that. And three months out, we saw quite a few of them have landed in good opportunities. We are still seeing a healthy percentage of students working overseas, so 14%. The dominant location for that is London. And 7% of the class founded a company, so that equals 65. And then 15% of the students joined a startup. So for us, that's 96 students. And I think this is one of those cases where it's good to use the actual number instead of just the percentage because the size of our class can hide a little bit, the, the numbers behind each of these. And then again, just to give you a sense of how many different places hire our students, 381 organizations hire a graduate from the class. So there's a lot of diversity in where our students go. In terms of the industry choices, we've continued to see a pretty good spread across all industries, but a lot of growth in technology. That's been a number that's been going up each year, and that's spread out over all areas of technology. So folks that are in services or hardware or software, there's a lot hidden in that 20%. With the venture capital private equity number, it's 20% combined this year. It was actually 5% venture capital, which is one of our highest venture numbers that I've seen in years. And then consulting, rounding it all out. So one thing I hope you can take away from this slide is there's a happy home for everyone. Not everybody is drifting to the same industries. So there's, there's a place for all of you. In terms of location, this is where folks landed. Most of those tech jobs do tend to be concentrated in Boston, New York City, and the Bay Area. So those percentages will reflect that. We have a pretty heavy percentage of the students staying on the East Coast, but a large percentage of them also going to the West Coast with that 26%. So huge portion of the class um, out there. And then a sign of the times. So this is just an interesting slide we like to include to see where things are ebbing and flowing. So from many, many years ago, 20 years ago to now, you can see how the lines go up and down. So hard to know where the class of 2020 will go, but I, I would expect to still see some growth in, in technology. And founder owner is another one that 
I think, you know, typically you'll see somewhere between seven and 8% of the class starting their own business. Nonprofit, healthy percentage last year at 5%. So a lot of that's driven by our leadership fellows. So that's a program we have where we select organizations that give students access to the highest level of a nonprofit organization and the position is sourced for impact. So the sort of role that they do is typically one that a fresh MBA would not get the opportunity to do. And the position is one year. So the tagline is one year, once in a lifetime. We as a school pay half your salary, the organization pays half your salary. So really interesting jobs there tend to move that nonprofit number pretty significantly. And then salaries. So they're still going up. I mean, I, at some point, I think they should level a little bit. But uh, that 11, 12, 13 year of, of, of stable salary numbers, we haven't seen that in a little while. So it's very high. You'll all be fine. So good numbers there. And these are just base salaries. This is not even include the signing bonus or guaranteed bonuses. So very healthy numbers there. So the job search now, one thing that we, we've seen over the past couple of years is students want to be entrepreneurial, whether you're choosing to be in a large organization or starting your own, the role is, is meant to give you control. It's meant to give you choice and you're able to form your own vision for, for what your role can be. So that's something that we've seen big company to small company and it's very individual. So those coaches will have over 3,000 coaching appointments over the academic year. And if you have something urgent, you just need to drop in to coach on call, we have someone available Monday through Friday. So those, those resources are there whenever you need them. We tend to do small programs and, and offer really targeted help. So you might not be ready to start your job, job search in September. We're actually just teaching you what the different industries are, September and half of October. We hold employers off for the first six weeks. So you can learn what all these industries are and understand what an MBA would do in those industries. We bring our alumni back to talk to you about what they did in their internships, how they transferred that to a full-time opportunity. So you can listen to their guidance and learn from the different things they tried. So you don't have to necessarily trot a new path. You can learn from, from what they did. And then again, that lifelong career and professional development support. So one thing we just tried this fall for the first time was speaking with our second year students about life in the C-suite. So it's probably going to be a while for some of them before they're CEOs or, or have that C-level position, but they're curious about it. They're, they're definitely interested in what that role could look like. So we brought a firm in to talk about their searches for folks in the C-level positions, their folks is when they do a search for the board positions that you know, a lot of our students are interested in. So that professional development starts here, but continues as folks advance in their careers. So lots and lots of services to help you learn what the jobs are, negotiate different salaries if, if you don't end up with a, a great salary right out of the gate, and just the path to get there. Since most people are somewhat uncomfortable networking, we have a lot of programs to get you comfortable with it. So you practice with each other, it becomes more authentic, you get used to doing your pitch, it just gets easier. In terms of what we have available online, a ton of resources. So you could go through all of our videos, you could look at our company meeting notes. So a huge component of what my team does is create relationships with organizations that are of interest to you. So just yesterday, one of my sector leads who's in charge of consumer products did a session on hip and healthy. So different opportunities available in the health and wellness space and had loans and second years come back to talk about their work at companies like Oatly and Clover Food Labs, which are fun and interesting and, and really different. The job search is going to be different than if you're looking at really big consumer products companies versus a company that might only have two brand managers. So that's the kind of stuff that our sector leads will do when they're meeting with companies. They will create that warm connection so that you know who to go to when you're looking for an opportunity like that. 
And then we're really integrated with the MBA curriculum. So again, those six weeks at the start of school to do your self-assessment, to figure out what it is you really want and to learn what those opportunities are. And then a really big component of fields is your, your emotional intelligence. So what are you good at? Where do you struggle? How can you pitch yourself best? That's directly tied into the reflective elements of the curriculum. So it's a super quick version of the slides I had to go through and now I'll take questions. Awesome, so all of you who registered for this webinar have the chance to submit questions prior to this webinar. So we're gonna go through those first and then we'll be taking live questions from that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So a student wrote in and asked, what types of career resources are available for students that already have 10 years of work experience and are really looking to advance their mm -hmm. careers in an existing field to more senior positions? So this is a great example of why career coaching is individual, because the likelihood that there are jobs in, our, we call our system 1220, it's just the vendor, so 1220 is where we put all of our positions, and most of those are actually targeted to folks with three to eight years of experience. So the, the likelihood you see something in there that's relevant to you is lower. So your career coach is going to guide you into the, the types of roles that are more appropriate. So perhaps you're ready for a director level position. So how do you source those opportunities? What industries are you interested in? How do you pitch your skills as a little bit higher than where a traditional MBA would be coming out? So that individual task would be done one-on-one -on -one with a coach. Awesome. And are there any opportunities for alumni to engage with the Career Services Department post-graduation? All the time. So you have us forever. I really didn't believe that <laughs> when I first started working here. It's like, that can't be possible. But yeah. they get like, forever three, right? Or three. You get four complimentary coaching appointments a year, but it's the calendar year. So oftentimes people in the fall actually think, hmm, feels like time for a switch. So it's really four in the fall and then January it resets to so four in January. <laughs> but if you need more than that, I've never den denied anyone, but most folks are pretty well along in their job search after four. Sure, that's awesome. Uh, and the campus recruitment calendar, can mm -hmm. you talk about the importance of GMAT scores with any certain employers and sort of how the structure of the year looks like? So, GMAT seems to be getting less and less important. I think that the, the indication it, it gives employers is a little bit about the way you can take a test. So they might take that along with your undergraduate GPA, but we haven't seen that be a deterrent for most opportunities. I think that on-campus recruiting, the, the way it is now is spreading out a lot. So there's, there's an awful lot of recruiting that happens year round. We actually just launched as an office what we're calling on-campus flex because it just doesn't feel right anymore to have all the companies come during a certain time period. So now folks can come on campus at all times. So for organizations that have just-in-time needs in April, they can be on campus. They're, they're not confined to figuring out how to reach students off, off the regular cycle. So sure. there's definitely stuff that starts for internships in the fall, and there are company conversations throughout October and November. And then the very first deadline for any of our internships is, is typically late, late November, early December, with the very first interviews in January. So you've got time. You've got time to figure out what you want. I was talking with a student in one of my other webinars who had mm -hmm. said that they had decided after doing an internship and during the fall recruitment season that they really didn't want to go back to that yeah. industry. Yeah. And so they used that just in time sort of. Yeah, I mean, it's great to have it. I mean, I, I mean, think about it. Do you really know for sure, for sure, almost a year before you graduate what you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> you might not. So this, sure. this leaves you some, some roadway to figure it out. Awesome. And how does HBS support women in their professional careers? Well, no different from men, but I will say that there are a few special things that we have, especially around 
industries where women have been historically underrepresented. So for industries like finance, we have a women in investing organization that is led by one of our most popular professors, Kristen Mumford. She's a professor of management practice who came to us from Bain Capital, has a ton of street cred and is incredibly invested in, in mentoring all of our students. So she saw how fewer and fewer women were even pursuing opportunities of investing and created this group, one, so that you can work together and, and meet each other and understand what the work is like and whether or not it's, it's appealing to you, um, and, and two, make connections. So we actually send the resumes of all the women in investing or interested in women in investing to over 200 organizations. So a lot of students can source their opportunities directly from that outreach. And then for every other industry, it's pretty similar resources between men and women. So coaching, again, would be a, a huge resource for everyone. Um, we actually find that our women negotiate more than our men. So I don't know if they've read that women don't negotiate, but uh, it's not true here. <laughs> so the women are absolutely negotiating. So exciting. Uh, what levels of management and work responsibilities are common for our graduates? So that depends on industry. I would say in tech, a ton of students are coming out as product managers. That, that tends to be one of the more dominant um, functional choices. In private equity, typically at the VP level, although there are still some senior associates that are, are being hired maybe without previous experience. Sure. Consulting, consultant. Sometimes if you have previous experience, you'll come out as, as a manager, but, but not a ton of those. Uh, I would say in consumer products, probably brand manager. In the bigger firms, you're going to have to start as an assistant brand manager, usually. Um, but mostly at that sort of middle management level, I would say, is, is, is where most folks come out. Obviously, it depends on previous experience and in sure. industry. In what ways has the professional development services at HBS involved, evolved over the last several years? A lot. So I think some of the things that we've just expected students to figure out on their own, we've actually, it, it, we don't do that anymore. We have programs to help you. So things like professional, professional speaking so that you can hold a room's attention where you're, you know where to put your hands. You're, you're not you know, standing like a, a dinosaur when you're up, up there kind of keeping your hands like this, but you're, you look comfortable, you look relaxed. Mm -hmm. Making sure for students that don't speak publicly all that often, that they're aware of the ums, the ahs, the fillers, so that again, they can hold a room. So I think professional speaking is a, a huge component that Emotional intelligence, also something that we work on and making sure you know how to talk about your strengths and weaknesses in a way that's not fatal. So we'll, we'll, we'll help you with, with that a ton. Uh, that networking, networking again is, is really important and, and it's going to be important way beyond your years at HBS. But again, it doesn't come super naturally. So we literally practice it with fake conversations, getting you beyond small talk, some of those never talk about the weather kind of things to, to really elevate the conversation right away so that you can capture the person you're talking to and get their attention. That's awesome. And can you tell us some of the various ways that students interact with companies? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on how established the organization is on, camp, on campus and sort of the MBA recruiting. For, for those folks, they'll do a presentation, although presentations I see dying a slow death. So students yeah. can really get a lot of that information online. And, and unless you're going to do something that captures their attention in a new way, I don't know how much longer those will live. What are helpful are these things called company conversations or coffee chats, where it's individual, you can get a sense of the company, they can get a sense of you, and it's just more targeted. So I think those will continue to happen. One of the I guess one of the best things that our students take advantage of are that we call them industry education, but it's really just an interesting topic. So one of our recruiters is, is Dick Sporting Goods, and their CEO was in the news this fall for not selling guns in a lot of their stores. So that was a very relevant topical industry education around 
their choice to not sell guns. So no matter what side of the debate you're on, it was an interesting discussion. Sure. So that kind of stuff that's timely and relevant, whether it's a merger between two behemoths or a failed product launch or a successful product launch, those are the kind of things that organizations will come to campus to talk about with the students. And those are usually really well attended. I was always impressed with how many students had said there were so many who used the career development professional services, but mm -hmm. there were also, I've talked with students who, who literally just found jobs by mm -hmm. being on campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's so true. So even, so yesterday at the health and wellness session, one of the second years was talking about how she got her internship. So one of our sector leads was doing a company visit to Oatly, where she was touching base with an alum she'd worked with 10 years ago as a student, and she just stayed in touch. And again, because we help you with your careers for life, we tend to stay in touch. So she was visiting him, and he'd gone from, I think, P&G to Giovanni to now Oatly, and she just had taken a picture with him and put it on her Instagram account and said, Oatly's hiring if anyone's interested. And one of my students saw the Instagram posting, reached out to, his name's Mike, reached out to Mike and said, hey, <laughs> let's, let's talk. And she got her internship from Instagram. So it, it can really happen uh, in so many different ways. Well, the student I was talking to was in the professor's class, who's now the GE. Um, oh, yes, Larry Culp. Yeah, he hired five of our interns last year, right into GE, into the C they were basically all supporting C-level executives. Yeah, I know, they all got return offers too, it's crazy. I was, it's great, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just so impressed with how many different ways there are to interact with these jobs. Absolutely, yes. Us. And another student had asked what role do alumni play in current students' professional development? So we spoke a little bit yeah. just now. There's, I mean, there's definitely a ton of alums who come back to do recruiting. So, okay. I mean, I think of the 80,000 alumni, there are so many that come back and do recruiting. And, and really, it's, it's one of those just pay it forward kind of relationships. So an alum helps you out as a student, you're a lot more inclined to help a student out as an alum. I've got one alum who's, he's my favorite alum. He services every April, he's a venture capitalist, so he's a ton of portfolio companies. And every April, he's like, who you got? You know, I, just, I need to hire some interns. So he puts a bunch of interns into all of his portfolio companies, sometimes hires directly for his VC. And he just does it really casually, which is fun. But yeah. I have other alums who are a lot more targeted and, and post positions. But, uh, there's quite a few, well over a thousand, who also serve as guides to our students. So you have access to all 80,000 in our alumni directory. But about a thousand of them have a special designation that they're, they're happy to be career guides for you. So not quite a coach, but a lot more than your average alum. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And we are going to take some of those live questions now as we've answered the ones that came in via the registration link. So one student is asking about our professors typically understanding about missing class time. Mm. Um, and I think that's oh, a really important one. This is such an important one. No. They are not. So I think this has actually been one of the things that we've needed to think about the most as the job search has extended throughout the school year. So one thing that we have instituted is excused absences for recruiting. So now students have six absences in addition to anywhere between 10 and 15 open days each semester so that yeah. you can balance your job search not every company is going to be available on our open days, which we understand. So you've got those six absences to work with, which typically is enough. And an open day is no class. It's just a day that you have to use for whatever you want. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was always impressed that that was actually structured into our program. Yes, yes, yes. So you can take advantage of those. But again, in the, in the spring, it's you, spring break is a great time to do a job search. It's actually a great just-in-time job search. Mm -hmm. So. Think about that, right ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Daisy is asking, uh, many of the students are career switchers. So she was specifically asking about a pre-MBA internship. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you really don't need to do that. So from, from our perspective, it's a tiny percentage of the class that actually does a pre-MBA internship. Most of the time, it's, it's better to be reflective, take time to, to chill. The program's intense, so when you get here, it really is 
going to be a lot. So make sure you understand what it is you really want to be doing once you arrive on campus. We'll, we'll help you make that transition. There, there is a winternship that we offer for one of our sectors, investment management. Actually, this is a good answer to the women question as well. So this is open to anyone for whom investment management is new to them. So one of our professors leads you through stock pitches, understanding what it's like to work in investment management, and then we connect you with an organization where you spend a couple of weeks during the January term working and really experiencing what it's like. So that one, Women Over Index on that one because um, sure. they haven't done it as much before. Awesome. And Jesse mm -hmm. is asking about support and encouragement for entrepreneurship. So much. Yeah. So it's actually, I think you know, part of the feedback we've gotten is we have so many resources, it can be hard to figure out which one you need to use when. So I think first and foremost, the Rock Center for Entrepreneurship is your go-to place. It's staffed with entrepreneurs and residents who can talk about all the different elements of starting a company, from having a really good business plan to getting funding to not and, and bootstrapping it on your own. So you can use the entrepreneurs and Reddit residents for guidance. We have a ton of business plan competitions. So you can get funding from the school, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's, it's all for the taking to the strongest business plan. So the Rock Center will also do programs to get entrepreneurs thinking about different things and, and making sure any of their missing skills are, are being shored up. And then we have the iLab. So the Innovation Lab is, is Harvard-wide, so you can benefit from all the other schools at, at Harvard. They'll do things like have a program on Google search so that you know how to make your business appear at the top. They'll have lawyers come in for thinking about creating an LLC so you know how to do all of that. So it's, it's an embarrassment of riches that you really do need to figure out which ones are going to be most relevant for you. We also have coaches on our team that have started their own businesses and can also help point you in the right direction so you don't get too overwhelmed with all the different opportunities. Yeah, my favorite of all the entrepreneur opportunities is the um, entrepreneurship fellowship. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I think it helps provide equity. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we give you a lot of money. So really, it's, it's a way for you to safely experiment mm -hmm. while you're a student. So we will we'll pay up to, I think it's about six or eight thousand dollars for the summer, which is quite a lot to help you figure out what whether or not this is going to work, whether or not it's for you, and meet most of your living expenses. So a, a bunch of students can co-found a company together and all qualify for that funding so that you're, you're really experimenting in a safe zone. Yeah, I think it's really amazing because it helps I mean, students from any background, being mm -hmm. from nonprofits, going into an MBA. Yes. It could be, I was a little intimidated, I'm sure many Absolutely. people would be. This makes it easy. So they really make it easy. It's, it's so impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's go through just a couple more questions. We have one or two minutes left. Um, couldn't we talk about, yeah, you want to yeah, start? Let's do this one. Um, this one is, is asking about the percentage of the incoming class that has a clearly defined career goal and sticks to it. <laughs> Probably five students, I think, have a clearly defined goal and stick to it. So one thing that um, we do not do is compare what you say on your application to HBS to what you actually do. Uh, almost never <laughs> relates. And I think a lot of that's great because you just didn't know what was available to you. When, when I came here as a student, I was clueless on almost every industry other than my own. So it's a, it's a great way to open your mind to the possibilities that you didn't know existed. So I, I know 80% of our students do some sort of pretty big pivot while they're here, but I think almost all of them change their minds as to what they wanted. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that wraps up our time here today. I want to call people's attention to the recorded webinar section on our website. We specifically have an entrepreneurship webinar, which is almost 40 minutes long, going through the mm -hmm. plethora of opportunities that there are for entrepreneurs. And we have a lot of other segment uh, webinars as well, where we can really go into detail on an industry or on a group. 
um, and the opportunities specific to them. So check that out if you have any other questions. You can also email us at admissions at hbs.edu. Uh, our phone number is also listed on our website, so feel free to call in. Mm -hmm. But overall, we wanted to thank you for joining us, and thank you so much. Again, this was Kristen. Kristen Fitzpatrick is the Managing Director of Career and Professional Development, so you heard it from the source. <laughs> We're very happy to have her time here for admissions. So again, call our phone number, email us at admissions at hbs.edu. But thanks so much for joining, and, and we look forward to seeing your applications at some point soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.